Welcome to our webcast. I'm Lester Knudsen, and uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Informix best practices. This is the first in a new series. But first, let me do a sound check. And Armand, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, can you hear me okay, Armand? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to put everybody on mute. Uh, otherwise, we get background noise. Uh, during the webcast, and I'm going to dive right in. So I've been working with Informix since uh, 1983, and uh, this is uh, sort of a series we're going to do uh, over the next uh, four months, one each month, on best practices for using Informix. And uh, this one I, I'm going to call Getting Started with Informix. Uh, part of it is an overview of Informix, the architecture, uh, planning and install. We'll do an install demo and then uh, talk about setting up uh, and getting ready for uh, using Informix. Uh, so let me uh, just quickly go through what Informix is for those who are not familiar with it. It started back in uh, 1983. Uh, as something called a CI SAM library. And I was a C programmer, and I thought this was cool. Uh, this was a library that I could use to find a record in a file. Um, on top of that, uh, they built the Informix standard engine. Uh, and then on top of that, they built Informix Online, which uh, was one of the first databases to use shared memory and uh, raw disk. This was way back in the 80s. Uh, and also, it was the first database where you could do a backup while the server was running transactions. Uh, then from Informix Online, uh, Informix 7 uh, came, uh, and then Informix 8. Informix 8 was really cool because that was uh, for a database that didn't fit on one machine. Um, I know there's a site that had uh, 120 uh, servers together uh, that was one database. Uh, that's easy to do nowadays, but back then that was pretty uh, interesting. And then uh, Informix 9 and 10, and the current version is 11 and 12. And I'm going to focus on 12 in this webcast. Now, a bit of uh, verbiage on the additions. Uh, there are two no-cost editions. There's an Informix Developer Edition. And uh, if you're a developer, you should have this. Put it on your laptop. Uh, it's easy to use. Get started a good way to uh, play play around uh, with, with it. And then there are the Purchase Editions. And I've highlighted the two that I see the most common, the Workgroup Edition and the Enterprise Edition. Uh, and I'll point you to a paper at the end that sort of describes the difference. Um, the Express and the Workgroup uh, and the Informix Advanced Developer Edition all have limits on memory and CPU. Uh, the Enterprise Edition uh, is unlimited in terms of memory and CPU that you can use. Now, the way you license Informix, uh, there are a number of ways to do it. One is by processor value unit. You basically uh, tell IBM what the CPU you, you're using is, and they assign it a processor value unit, and then you can run as many users as you want uh, on that. There's also a authorized single user install where you can go to IBM and say, I have 20 users, so I need 20 licenses. Now, the single user install doesn't work when you're attached to a web server. There's also a virtual, uh, um, if you have virtual servers, there's a licensing for virtual servers. There, so there's several options here on licensing. Now, once you've got the server, you need uh, a way to connect tools. And the Informix SDK uh, is sort of the basic way to connect uh, your your tools. It includes a connection to a C compiler, includes ODBC, in, includes the open admin um, 
tool, and in version 12, it includes DB Access, and that's free, uh, and you can put that on as many machines as possible. Then there's the Informix Enterprise Gateway. There's a JDBC driver, which I'm seeing a lot of use of nowadays, and then you also have the IBM Common uh, Server. Now, in addition to being a database, Informix is extendable, and there are a number of data blades that um, come with Informix. Some are extra cost, some come with it. Uh, the two that I'm most familiar with and used the most are the spatial and the time series. The spatial uh, data blade adds four new data types. Uh, think of one as a geo point uh, on the world. It's a point, uh, a geospatial point. A second data type is a line. A third is a shape. Uh, and the shape could be like a county, a city, a building. And then the fourth data type is an image, which could be like a satellite image. And this allows you to extend regular SQL and do queries like, show me all the coffee shops within five miles of this point. And then there's a spatial uh, data blade. So there are a lot of options. Uh, you can build your own extensions too. For developers, uh, you have Informix ESQLC, Informix 4GL, and basic Informix SQL. Uh, there's a modern uh, GUI uh, Informix Genero, which is like a GUI version of Informix 4GL. Uh, and then you can also develop in Java, PHP, uh, Ruby, and several other open source tools. Now, once you get Informix up and running, to administer it, uh, you have the command line tools, and I'm going to show you some of those today. Uh, you also have the open admin, which is a web-based GUI uh, that you can do pretty much everything uh, you do with the command line tools. Um, and there's also a third-party product called a Server Studio, which allows you to administer an Informix server. Uh, that's a Java client that will run on your PC or Mac and uh, connect to all of your Informix servers. This is a screenshot of the open admin tool, and uh, it's a server I just set up yesterday. Uh, it shows me the memory, the space usage of that server, and since it was a new server, nothing was running. Uh, it doesn't show me uh, that it's very busy. So let's talk a little bit about the architecture of Informix. And, and all this is background uh, to get into installing it and what are the best practices for installing it and getting started with it. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to cover the background a little bit. Uh, there are four parts to Informix uh, architecture. There are the SQL clients. There's the server process, which is on an it. There's the shared memory, and there's uh, the disk space. And this diagram sort of shows uh, what uh, it looks like. You have your SQL clients, and they connect to a series of processes called on and its. And all those on and its share the same Informix shared memory. And they all have special functions. Uh, some handle disk I.O., some handle clients, some handle auditing, some handle network communications. And um, they all work together. So let's take a look at an Informix install. If I just do a PS minus EF and do a grep for on an it, uh, I'll see all the on and its I have running. And I actually have two Informix servers running on this machine right now. Uh, you can tell that because I have two that begin with uh, the parent ID of one. Uh, those are the master uh, on and it demons that are running on the server. Um, so, PS minus EF will show you all the on and its running um, on your server. 
onstat minus g sch will show you what the onanets are doing. And so if I come back here, onstat minus g sch, I'm only showing the onanets for the server I'm connected to. And this gives me their Unix process ID and the class tells me what they're doing. Like the AIO ones are all doing IO. Um, the CPU is a CPU on a net. Uh, the, the admin on a net uh, is an admin on a net. The next webcast, I'll go through uh, tuning these on a net. So what's the best practice for that? Uh, you don't want to have too many and you want to have enough to get the job done. And we'll talk about that in the next webcast. Here's a list of the uh, classes that will be available. In a shared memory, there are uh, four blocks of memory Informix uses. In some older versions, they'll show up as only three blocks because the resident uh, memory segment and the buffers will all be combined. Uh, but think of it as a resident uh, memory segment is the first segment. It has the control tables. And then uh, if the buffers are not in a separate buffer segment, it will have the buffers. And uh, the buffers are where it caches data that people are using. And the basic advantage of that is that if somebody uh, does a select, that data is brought into the buffer. And the next person who wants to use that same data uh, can get it from the buffer. I was working with a client uh, not too long ago that had 96 gigs of RAM on their machine and their database was about 80 gigs. And guess what? We had the whole database running in memory. Uh, super fast that way. Uh, if you can do it, that's, that's you want as, as much uh, memory uh, for buffers as possible. The second memory segment is the virtual memory segment. And think of that as working space. That's where uh, your sort space, your data dictionary caches are, uh, your working storage, uh, everything that people are using, uh, all the work happens in the virtual memory segment. The third segment is the message segment. And uh, that's where uh, data is passed between a client and the server. So with those different memory segments, uh, how you manage them is really important. And again, my next webcast uh, will talk about best practices for setting up memory. Uh, this is an example. If you do on stat minus G S E G, let's run that on my real system here. Um, okay, I've got uh, one resident segment, a virtual segment, uh, two buffer segments, uh, because I have two buffer pools here, a message segment, and then a second virtual segment. And uh, we'll talk about that and setting that up in the next webcast. And then disk space. Uh, this uh, deserves a webcast of its own. And so the third webcast is going to focus on setting up disk space. Uh, Informix uses two types of disk space, raw and cooked. And cooked is file system disk space uh, where you can uh, do an LS or a DIR and see the files Informix is using. Raw is when Informix directly accesses the disk, uh, and it's either a form, an unformatted disk partition or a logical volume partition. Now, Informix keeps things in DB spaces, which is a logical container of a bunch of chunks. And, um, and the way to think about it is you have a DB space and it can have one, two, three, as many chunks as you want. The chunks are your physical uh, devices. The uh, DB space is your logical device. On my server here, let's just take a look.
I have a whole bunch of uh, chunks out here, and these are all the physical uh, devices that I have created over time uh, to uh, to store data. And uh, like I said, there'll be a whole webcast on this uh, by itself because how you do it and best practices for, for doing it are very important. Um, if you do an onstat minus D, that will show you, the top part of it shows you the DB spaces. Now I have 11 DB spaces. The bottom part shows you that you, I have 12 chunks. One chunk is, um, just a comment here, somebody keeps unmuting, please uh, stay muted because the background noise uh, gets very distracting for everybody trying to, to listen. Uh, if you have a question, save your questions uh, at the end. I'll stop and, and open up uh, the lines and, and chat and we'll take questions then. Um, okay, where was I? Now, as uh, you add tables, uh, tables get spread out over time, and this is one of the things we'll talk about in the third uh, webcast, is uh, your tables can also become fragmented, and that will slow access. And uh, we'll talk about how do, you, how do you deal with that and what are the best practices for setting up tables. On stat minus D, as I showed, showed you earlier, shows you your, your DB spaces and chunks. Now users, users are these SQL clients at the top. Uh, they're all the, the, the different sessions that connect to Informix. And uh, we'll, we'll do a couple of examples at the end here. Uh, it could be DB access, it could be a Java program, it could be a web client. The command to see your users is on stat minus u. That will show you all the users and um, what uh, their session ID is. That's this number right here. That's the key number in Informix uh, for identifying the user. Now, on mine, it isn't very helpful because all my users are in Informix. This is my little development system. Um, that I was using. Now, so let's start with best practices. What do you need to do to plan an Informix install? The first thing you want to do is think about where you're going to install the software. And uh, it's very important uh, because what you want to do is, is plan it so that you can easily do upgrades in the future. And so what I think is a best practice is, uh, and I'm going to CD here to uh, opt, where I've been, whoops, CD slash opt. And uh, I have uh, four different versions of Informix running, each in their own separate directory. This way I can switch between versions fairly easy. I can uh, install FC8, which is the latest, and uh, do some tests. Uh, but I have uh, Informix, uh, and if you look at my environment variable, uh, my Informix dir points to uh, opt Informix. Uh, that's a link to FC6. So that tells you that's my current version that I'm using right now um, is FC6. So good practice is to always install Informix in a separate directory. Uh, and put the version number in the directory so you know uh, what version uh, you have uh, installed. So that's the first thing you need to think about. Where are you going to install Informix? On Linux systems, I usually put it in slash op. Uh, I used to, on AIX systems, put it in local apps. Uh, it's, it can go pretty much anywhere. Some, some clients set up a special file system for the Informix software. Now this is the software, not the data, not the databases. Uh, this is just the software. The second thing is you need to have names for your Informix server. 
And this is very important because it's what people are going to use to connect. Um, and I try and find meaningful names like uh, it's good to have application names. Uh, I'm using train one and train one TCP here just to show I've got uh, one server. Uh, train one is for the shared memory connections. Train one TCP is for the network connections. But you need to decide on the name of your Informix server. And then you need to decide on how much memory you're going to allocate to Informix. Uh, and there are three variables that are really important uh, with this, buffer pool, shared memory virtual size, and shared memory add. Uh, I'll go through some best practices in the next webcast on sizing this. But the key to think, the key thing is you don't want your total memory to be bigger than the physical memory. You want all of Informix uh, to stay in memory and not swap out. Uh, but you want to use as much memory as possible. And the more you can, uh, the bigger you can make your buffer pools, uh, the more data can be uh, saved in memory. And then you need to think about uh, disk space and one of the things, I've got a list here of different types of uh, disk space that you're going to need to allocate for Informix. Uh, you only need the root space to get started, even though I'm going to allocate a few more in just a minute when we do an install. Uh, but you need to think about space for your logic logs, your physical logs, your temp DB space, where your data is, where your indexes are going to go, if you have blobs, which are bi binary images, and if you have certain smart blobs, which are, are uh, smart blob spaces, uh, those, those are all optional. Uh, but you at least need a root DB space. I think it's a good best practice to have a logical log DB space, a temp DB space, and a data DB space. And then you need to decide whether you're going to use raw or cooked space uh, and where that will be located. Now, I like to have everything in something called Informix chunks. And um, if I'm using raw or cooked files, uh, I might have them on other disks uh, and use symbolic links so that they all point to that one place. Uh, I was working with a client that was really, really had a good system. They had uh, one directory in Formix chunks, and then they had each server uh, had had a directory there, and then they had all their links. And their links uh, were actually pointers to devices on multiple disks, multiple file systems. But that way they had one place where you could go look and see what all the links are for. Uh, on our system here, um, I have something called, uh, let's just go directly to Informix Chunks. I have three servers here. I have a new server, which uh, I'll show you the install for that in a minute. I have train one and train six. And so if I look at, um, These, uh, I can see the raw spaces, uh, the, not the raw space, I'm sorry, the cooked space that is out there um, for my server. But this way I have it all organized uh, under Informix chunks um, by server. And again, if uh, I'm using raw devices particularly, or if I have them on other devices, that's okay. I'll create links here uh, so that in one place, I know where all my space is. Now, another, I think, very important uh, uh, best practice, if you're going to use cooked space, use a non-journaled file system. And uh, the way to think about it is Informix um, is a journaling system. Uh, the database server does journaling itself. 
And if you have a journal file system where you're putting the data on, the journal file system is going to do double journaling. And you want to avoid that. Uh, on Linux, uh, the best thing to use if you're going to use a cooked file system is ext2. Um, there are other non-journal file systems, but you want a file system that won't do journaling. The worst thing that can happen with a journal file system is that informants will think it wrote something and has it in the journal, and then the file system will, because it's journaling it, not quite write it, but write it to the journal, and then you crash, and then it tries to recover, and it, it, there's a mismatch between the uh, Informix journal and the file system journal. Um, the other thing I'll talk about this uh, when we talk about disk space is you don't want to use RAID 5. Uh, I can go on and on uh, about stories of, of problems with RAID 5. Um, I know companies that insist they have to use RAID 5 because that's all they can use, but uh, you're running a risk when you do use RAID 5. Another question is how many CPUs are you going to allocate for uh, Informix? Uh, traditionally, uh, it used to be uh, you'd say the number of cores minus one. Uh, however, cores have gotten so fast nowadays that you can easily run two to three cores uh, per on and it. And uh, in, in future webcasts, we'll talk about, about this. Uh, one, one rule of thumb is for about every 500 megahertz uh, of CPU power, you can run one on and it. Uh, now, the question you've got to think about is uh, if you have 10 cores and you run 20 on and it's, is that going to max out? all your CPU. You don't want your CPU 100% uh, busy all the time. You want to save some CPU power for when it needs to uh, accelerate and uh, have faster, faster time. So these are things you need to think about uh, when you're installing Informix. Uh, also, what kinds of network protocols will you be using to connect? Uh, are most users connecting uh, with shared memory, with TCP sockets, with DRDA, or with the REST interface? And also, what ports will you be using? And you'll see this when I do the install. Uh, in Formix, um, if you're using a network interface, it needs a port, and that port can't be used by anything else. And so you have to find a free port that Informix can use and then establish that for Informix. And then a the last thing is, are you going to be installing the open admin uh, tool? And uh, you need a login for that and a password and a port for the open admin tool. Now, the great thing about the open admin tool uh, is it can, one install of the open admin tool can administer multiple Informix servers. And um, so you don't need uh, to have the open admin tool installed with each server. In fact, I typically don't. Uh, I will typically do a separate install of just the open admin tool uh, in a separate directory. And on my server here, if I look at slash opt, uh, I have the open admin tool installed separately in the IFX SDK directory. Um, I have OAT there. And uh, so that, that way I can upgrade my Informix servers independently of OAT and I can upgrade OAT independently of the Informix servers. As you can see, my OAT install is from 2015. Uh, it's, it's a bit old, uh, probably should upgrade it. Uh, and I've gotten an Informix install from uh, two days ago uh, when I installed FC8 on this machine. Now, I want to uh, 
do a demo of installing Informix. And uh, to save time, I did this yesterday and made a video clip of it. And then I speeded it up. It, it took about 15 minutes. Uh, I speeded it up a little bit, so it'll take about six or seven minutes uh, to do the install and uh, show you the prompts and uh, and uh, see how it goes. So, so let's uh, let's start this, and I'm going to st uh, stop it along the way and and give you some ideas of what to do. So the first thing you do is you go download the install media from IBM's website. And uh, I got a tar file here. I'm going to make a directory uh, to untar it in, and I'm CDing to that directory. And I'm going to move the tar file into that directory and extract it. And then uh, you need to become root uh, to do the actual install. Now, there is a way of installing without becoming root. Uh, but my preference is always to let root do the install because then uh, Informix uh, can set the permissions uh, in the best way possible. Uh, Non-root installs, though, are an option. So I issue root, and I run the install, uh, IDS install. Now, now, I'm running a command line version of the install. Uh, I'm old fashioned. I like the command line. I was talking to someone else recently who did the GUI installs. Uh, you'll notice that uh, it is a, uh, where does it say it? Uh, it is a Java in program. In fact, the install is uh, from install anywhere. And uh, because of that, uh, it does have to have the right version of Java. One of the problems, in fact, all the problems I've had with installs have to do with install anywhere and the Java and the Java version that they use. So if you're having problems installing it, uh, that's the first thing to look at. And, and actually do a Google for install anywhere problems, and you'll often find the solution to it. So first, it asks you to uh, accept the license agreement. And then it asks you for a path where it's going to put the stuff. And I'm going to tell it to put it in a directory called FC8. It says, is that correct? I say yes. And then it asks me, I can do a typical install where it installs a bunch of stuff. You can do a custom install, or you can do very specific products. I always do a custom install, so not because I want to pick certain things. Uh, well, I do sometimes. Uh, but I'm going to show you a custom install because I think that's the best option. When you do a custom install, it gives you a list of features. And if there's an X by that feature, it's going to be installed. Uh, you notice there's no X by OAT, uh, so OAT is not going to be installed. If I wanted to install everything, uh, I, if I wanted to install OAT, I could come back and do this install and just install OAT and uncheck everything else. Um, I'm going to go with the default set of features that are being installed. And uh, again, sec another license agreement. Now, role separation. You can create separate roles at, for the install so that there can be a DBA role, an operator role, an audit role, a DB security role. Uh, or you can uh, not create separate roles. And, and when you don't create separate roles, the user in Formix is the role that has everything. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, two, which is not creating role separation. I think in 99% of the cases, uh, it's, it's a better choice. There are a few cases. Uh, and a, an example of where you want role separation is where you have people doing uh, backups uh, who you don't want to have uh, do the Informix password. And so you can, you can create an operation role and have people doing backups. Or you want an audit role, and the auditor wants to be able to audit the Informix uh, user. Then you want role separation. Now, another prompt here is, do you want to create a default server instance? I always say no. 
because I like to create my, my own instance. And it shows me when it's going to install. It's going to go out and install it. And boom, I'm done. And now I have uh, FC8 out there. I'm going to uh, create a environment file. Uh, so now I can access this install. And I'm going to read in my old environment file and modify it uh, for uh, FC10, um, FC8. Uh, and I'm going to create a new server. I'm going to call it new server. And uh, that's going to become my environment file. And uh, now if I do an onstat minus, it says, hey, that server is not initialized. Now, you notice I exited it out as root. Um, I should have done that last step as Informix because I'll have to reset my environment in a, mi in a minute. But uh, I'm done being root. Uh, and so um, the, everything else I'm going to do now to get a server up and running, I can do as Informix. Now, the first thing I'm going to do to get a server up and running is I'm going to create a directory for my chunks. And uh, then I'm going to create my chunks. I'm going to create a root DB space. I'm going to create a log DB space. I'm going to create a temp DB space. And I'm going to create a data DB space. Then I need to check the permissions on those chunks. And uh, the default permissions are not right. I want them to be read, write, group, and user informix and no public access. So that's why I'm doing a change mod 660. Uh, now I've got the permissions right. I also need to change the directory I'm in uh, since I just created it. And uh, there I am with the right permissions on that. Now I go back, I'm going to source the, the environment file. And what this is doing is taking what's in that file and making it part of my current environment. A dot means read that file and make it part of my current environment. So now I'm going to CD to inform Xtur. And uh, here's my new installed software. Uh, I'm going to CD into the etc directory and create an SQL host file. And I'm going to do that by reading my default uh, generic SQL host file which has my other two servers in it. And I'm just going to add uh, my new server. And I'm going to add a shared memory connection for it and a TCPI version for it. Now, the four columns. The first column is the name of the server. The second column is the type of network connection. The third column is the name of the machine you're running on. And the fourth column is the port you're going to be using. For network, I mean, for shared memory connections, you don't need a port. So I'm just going to call it new server. For the network connection, I need to get a port that's not in use. So I'm going to look at the services file. And IBM uh, has worked with the SQL vendors to add 9088 and 9089 uh, as the official uh, IBM Informix uh, ports. And you can use any port that's unused, but I like to uh, focus on using those too. Uh, so I'm already using SQL exec, uh, so I'm going to use 809089. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is copy the onconfig file. And I always start with copying the standard onconfig file that comes with a server even when you're doing an upgrade, because this will have the new features. If I copied the old on config, I might lose some of those new features. So the best practice here is always start with a copy of onconfig.std when you're creating a new server. So now I have a copy of that. I'm going to v vi on config. And um, there are only a few things that need to change. One is I need to change the path to point to my uh, root DB space. I'm going to set the size to 2 gigs. I, I pretty much, I think it's best practice just to use 2 gigs uh, for a small server. Um, 
I'm going to take out the root pass because uh, we're not using mirroring. Uh, I'm going to go down and change the message directories, and I like to have them in the same directory, and I like to put the server name as part of that file. So if I have multiple servers, it's very easy to find uh, which server log I need to look at. And I'm going to change the console uh, to console.log, so it actually reads console.log. Now, since this is a new server, I want to change tape dev to null because I don't have uh, tape dev set up. And then this is the most important thing. The server number has to be unique on that machine. So I need to go out and look and see if I have any other servers with this server number. So I'm going to exit and look in my uh, Informix directory for server number. And you can see I have uh, 0, 1, and 6 used. So I can use any other server number except 0, 1, and 6. So I'm going to use 2. And I'm going to give it a name, new server. And I'm going to create an alias for network connections, new server TCP. And then this is just an extra step I like to do is set up a net, net type for the TCP connections required to get a server running. Now, this is what I call the key step, on init minus i. What I'm going to do is initialize a server. Think of this as formatting the root DB space. Uh, so you want to be very careful. You never want to do on init minus i on a production server or on a server you're really using. Um, it does give you a prompt. I've seen people say yes and wipe out the server, and then I'm done. Now, if I do an on stat minus m, my server's up and running. Uh, let's go look at it. I've got one root DB space out there. If I look at the uh, Informix chunks directory, I, I set an environment variable uh, for this, makes it easier uh, to do things. Um, so if I ls what's there, you'll see that now the root DB space is two gigs. And so let's create the other DB spaces. I'm first going to create the log space. Now this creates the space. It doesn't move the logs there. I'm going to create a temporary space. It creates the space. It doesn't move temp there yet. Uh, that's a later step. I have to do that, and we'll go through that next week. Um, I'm creating a temp space now. This is going out there in formatting space, so it's taking a bit long. Now I'm taking, creating a data space. Now it says I need to do an uh, archive. I'm going to ignore that message for a minute, but this is a good point to do an archive. So let's go into DB Access. Whoops, I went through that too quick. Uh, what I wanted to show you was I had four databases there. Now I'm going to create, this comes with Informix. It's a good little database uh, to play around with. And um, now I'm going to go into DB Access, and there's my demo database, and I can do a select now, and I get data. So there I am up and running uh, with my Informix instance all created. So let's talk about the directory structure for a minute. Uh, when you install Informix, it creates a number of, of uh, files out there in uh, opt. Uh, let's do this. Uh, and some of the key ones are the bin directory. This is where your executables and binaries are. The demo directory is where your demo stuff is. The ETC directory is where your uh, configuration files are. You notice that's where I changed SQL host and the on config file. The include uh, is where your uh, library files are. The error messages uh, is in the message directory and the release directory is in the release directory. One key one I want to show you, I want to go to uh, just to illustrate. Let's go to Informix 
and let's go to release. Um, there's one file, and under release, so if you're in the U.S., it'll say ENUS, and then if you do an LS, you'll have the part number for the product. There's one file that I think is very important, and it's the IDS machine notes.txt. Uh, the best practice is when you get a new install, go read that file, because that will tell you. Let me open it up here. Oh, got to use the eye, not boo. That will tell, tell you uh, what the particular, and it's going to be different for whether you're on AIX or Solaris or Linux or Mac or Windows. It will tell you for your version, uh, what are the system requirements uh, that need to be there. Uh, it will tell you things like uh, what, what works, what doesn't work, uh, certain kernel parameters. So it will give you the basics that you need uh, and and I I, don't, I should have said this earlier. Before you do the install, in fact, you want to want to go read this and make sure that you have those kernel settings set up and ready. Now let's just talk a little bit about using uh, Informix SQL, and uh, I want to show you some options in a minute. Uh, to connect to Informix, you need to have these four environment variables. Uh, Informix dir, which is where uh, the products are installed. The path needs to include Informix dir bin, the name of the server you want to connect to, and then if you're a DBA, uh, you need to have the onconfig file. Very important that your onconfig file points to your Informix uh, server that you're going to use. I've seen people really mess up by having Informix ser server point to train one, as an example, and the on config file point to train six. Then what you're doing is making changes to train one based on the wrong on config file. Uh, so you really wanna, wanna do that. The way, that's why I like to have my on config file always be uh, on config dot server name. That to me is the, the best practice to keep it simple and, and easy to recognize. Uh, here's an example. Uh, you saw me create an example earlier on in that install video. Now, there are two uh, Informix SQL tools, DB Access, which is included uh, with the server, and it's the latest, it includes the latest SQL. And then there's a standalone product called ISQL. Uh, don't confuse the two. ISQL is at 7.5 now. DB Access is at 12.10, whatever the latest of the engine is. Uh, ISQL does include a character base report writer and a character base screen generator. Uh, now, DB Access, when you go into it, I'm going to just uh, go into it here real quick. Um, Actually, let's do this. Let me uh, make the environment my new server. So now if I echo dollar informix server, I'm pointing to that new server and I'm going into DB access and it's a ring character based ring type menu. Um, I can go here and see the databases that I have out there. And if I select, it will select the database. Now I can go exit and I just type the first letter or I use the space bar or the arrow keys. And I can go into query language and boom, I can start doing queries. Um, now, simple way to do it is just say select star from customer. And then this is this is a very simple editor. Uh, I hit escape, uh, that gets me out of that and, uh, edit mode, and I hit run, and it runs. Um, if I hit exit and go back to modify, 
I can modify this SQL statement. Uh, when I'm done, I hit escape. Uh, now, if you don't like a simple editor, and I don't, uh, I use VI. And so I always go into VI, edit my stuff, and uh, run it from there. Now, there are a couple of options with DB Access. I just want to show you some. One is DB Access, uh, dash, dash. And it takes you into interactive mode. Uh, so now I'm basically issuing SQL commands from the command line. So I'm going to say database uh, stores demo semicolon. It connects to that database. I'm going to do select now, and it selected my data. I can exit out of that by Control C or Control D. Um, you can also do things like. Uh, create here documents. So let's create a document real quick. I'm just going to call it uh, select.sql. And I can do DB access um, stores demo select.sql and it runs that SQL. Uh, so there are a number of things you can do in DB Access. Uh, you don't have to just use it uh, in, in the character mode. I find this very powerful for, uh, for running scripts, database name, script name. Another key one is find error. This is a utility to find an error. So let's say you type something wrong. And uh, if I do DB access, um, let's say X, I got an error. It says database not found. So I can type find error uh, 329. And it will give me a bit more information about what that error is. A whole bunch of Informix command line utilities. I've covered a few here in the course of this uh, lab. Um, I, I will save the rest for later. Uh, now, Informix documentation. Uh, I like to have the documentation on my laptop. It's all available online. But as an example, let me just go down to my desktop here. Um, I usually have a directory. Uh, with the documentation in it, uh, where I've downloaded it. And um, there's an index file I can use to open it up that will open up the files. Or I can go right into the documentation directory, and I, I know the ones I want, like the IDS admin is the PDF for the administrator's guide. And uh, that's one of those that I use a lot. Uh, but they're all available uh, in the Information Center. You can get various uh, versions all the way back uh, to seven there. The key manuals, if you're getting started with Informix, uh, there is a getting started with Informix. You want the administrator's manual and the reference manual. These are your two, uh, if you're a new administrator, uh, what you want to read. Uh, there's an Informix backup and restore guide, which is also very helpful. And there's a performance tuning guide, which is a little bit out of date and probably needs to be updated. If you're a programmer, the SQL reference and the SQL syntax. Uh, I, I use the SQL syntax all the time because that tells me uh, what's going on with the syntax. Now, a couple of things before I wrap up. Uh, Informix resources on the web. Uh, besides the documentation, there's a great uh, resource uh, from Carlton Doe uh, that compares the Informix versions. Um, and uh, here's a link to that. There is also a uh, and Carlton's doing a series of road shows. And let me see if I can get this link up to work. Uh, 
we have one here in the Washington, D.C. area uh, coming up. Uh, if you go to the WAG website, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see it. Uh, oh, that link didn't work. Um, IBM uh, has this habit of changing websites. So if you're here in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, whoops, what happened? We used to have it up here. Uh, April, we're going to have a road show here. Um, let me go to the IIUG website and see if the web, the road shows are up there. Uh, are the conferences there, view all web events. Uh, here, here are the road shows. Oh, those are last years. They haven't got it updated with the current ones. Bummer. Uh, anyway, check back soon. They should be up to date. Uh, the International Informix User Group is a great resource. Uh, membership is free. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention is the IIUG conference that is coming up. Uh, in April, and that should be a great event. Uh, there'll be a number of, probably the best place to go learn about informics. We also have a series of webcasts uh, coming up, and uh, they're on our website. You've, a number of you, I notice, have signed up for all of them. That's great. Um, and uh, the next one is uh, February 23rd, where we'll take a look at uh, the on config and focus on CPU and memory uh, configuration. What are the best practices for that? Uh, the one after that, March, will focus on disk and DV space. And then in April, we'll focus on disaster and backup recovery and high availability recovery. We also provide training and uh, advanced data tools has uh, some classes coming up. Uh, in April, we have a class for new Informix uh, database administrators. And in July, we have my favorite class. It's the Advanced Informix Performance Tuning class. Art Kegel and I teach that class together. And that's a lot of fun because we go through a series of, of benchmarks. Uh, showing you how to take something that at the beginning of the week takes 40 hours to run and then get it down to four or five minutes. Uh, now, one, one commitment we make is we will never cancel a class as long as one student is registered. Uh, and I've never in the last uh, eight or nine years had to cancel a class. Um, in fact, the problem we have is they tend to fill up. We keep the classes small, six to eight students. It really depends on how many machines we have and how many machines we're using for other projects because each student gets their own machine to run for a class. So in summary, and uh, let me go through a couple of slides here summarizing uh, the best practices and then I'll stop here for questions. Uh, always put each version of Informix in a separate directory. And then you can use a link to link to the current version. This way you don't have to change everybody's profile. That's one reason I like doing this. Uh, I was upgrading a client recently and they had everybody's profile hard coded uh, to Informix 12.10. I forget, FC4. And uh, so we actually, instead of having to change everybody, we just created a link to that. But that gave the wrong impression because we're running FC6. Uh, it's best to uh, create uh, ops and formix and uh, then link to the version you're running. Also, it's not a bad idea to keep tools separately. 
uh, from your server. Uh, and and you, you can put all the tools because the tools are basically at 7.5 uh, in one directory, uh, put the SDK and OAT in another directory, and then the servers in another directory. And this, this, this creates a, a very clean environment. Also allows you to test uh, new versions before you bring them into production. Uh, use the Informix server name as part of the onconfig, part of the uh, location of chunks, part of the location of backups. I meant to show you this earlier. Uh, on my server, uh, I, I have a directory here called backup, and I have a, uh, a uh, directory in there for each server. So uh, I have my logs and my on-tape backup uh, uh, in that directory. Uh, but by having the server name as part of that directory, I can keep multiple uh, servers there. And use symbolic links so you can move them around so that if this uh, file system got full, I can move them all to another file system, but then use a symbolic link to point back to this. Uh, Critical to use a non-journal file system for your cooked space. Uh, raw space is going to be the best. If you can't use that, use a non-journal file system. If you're on Linux, use ext2. And then create an environment file for each version that you have. Uh, I also like to download the Informix documentation so I have it on when I'm offline. Uh, you never know when you're going to be in a computer room with no internet access and have to look up uh, something. And also, uh, you want to take a look at our future webcast. Now, questions. And this is going to be uh, kind of fun. Let me uh, open up the chat, the participant list. And uh, I'm going to open up the chat. Yeah, Mike uh, sent links to the chat. It's funny, I checked those links uh, yesterday uh, to the roadshow, and um, Mike sent them out in the chat to everyone. Uh, so if you open up the chat, you should see the links uh, to them. Uh, they, the ones I had worked yesterday, these are the ones that work today. Um, does anybody have any questions? If the best way to do it is uh, to, uh, to uh, ask a question in the chat room. Everybody's real quiet. A uh, good question is what, where is the webcast recorded and stored? And uh, so let me ask that first. I've actually got a couple of questions here. Uh, so let me go back to our website. And if you go to our website, um, under webcast replays on the main page. You can see all our webcast here. And give me a couple of days, uh, probably uh, by, by Monday, definitely, uh, I'll have the replay for this webcast up. So you can see, uh, this is a great one, by the way, if you want more information uh, on uh, RAID 5 and storage. And this is the next question. Uh, when would you use raw disk and when would you use cooked disk? I'm going to refer you to this webcast. I'll talk about that in my uh, third webcast too, uh, but that's a very good question. My preference is to always use raw disk if I can. Uh, that's becoming harder to do because most people get these SAN systems and uh, they divide it up into file systems. Uh, raw disk will always perform a little bit better, and because it's raw, Informix directly writes to it 
when Informix writes to it, it knows that the data is is on disk. Uh, when you're writing to a CUP file, uh, even if it's uh, Informix opens up a CUP file with no buffering, uh, there's still a chance that the operating system may use some underlying buffering. And so Informix may think it's written something. Uh, I've seen this most often with journal file systems. Um, so it's faster and safer to always use raw disk. Uh, now, nowadays, though, that's becoming harder to do. And I've, I've worked with a number of sites where, uh, where that's, that's very difficult. Check in on my third webcast, and we'll talk about that some more. Any other questions? Well, I've gone a few minutes over, and um, I appreciate your patience. Thank you, everybody who attended. Uh, if you have more questions, drop me an email at lester at advanceddatatools.com. Um, I do travel a bit. I hate to tell you this. Uh, so if I don't respond right away, it's because I'm probably at a client site. Uh, I, I do have to work for a living. and. Uh, these, these webcasts are a, a fun uh, thing I do on the side in, in my spare time. Um, so uh, drop me a question uh, in email if you have any questions, uh, and I'll, I'll definitely uh, get back to you with an answer. And uh, with that, uh, I will end uh, this webcast. Uh, and thank you all for attending and look forward to seeing you on the next one. Have a good day, everyone. Goodbye now.